production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council, a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences. This time on Broad and High. We visit the Ohio History Connection to unearth some relics, both modern and prehistoric. And these teeth are huge, like this is a single tooth, this is a mastodon. The, the teeth on these are too big for their jaw. And a quiet artist whose work speaks volumes. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broaden High. I'm your host, Kate Manicky. Tonight, we're bringing you two installments of our Artifacts series. This is where we get a peek at some of the curiosities archived within the Ohio History Center. First up, history curator Eric Feingold tells me the story of how an Ohio company that started out making frames eventually rolled out one of the most popular and recognizable toys in pop culture history. Okay, Eric, we've got some fun stuff in front of us. What is the connection with all of these? Well, all of these pieces are made by a company called the Ohio Art Company, which is based out of Bryan, Ohio. Actually, the Ohio Art Company, which was founded in 1908 in Archbald, Ohio, started off making novelty items and metal picture frames. So what, what is this guy? So this is a uh, racetrack toy. Um, so the, the cars actually, you can see they have a little hole right in the side where a key would go. You would crank the key and then the cars would move along the tracks. It's a teeny tiny Mercedes. Right, exactly. That's so fun. And this is from what era? Uh, probably the 1950s to the 1960s. Okay. And then speaking of the 60s, I recognize this. But yes, I, This is an Etch-a-Sketch. Everyone knows Absolutely. these. Absolutely. What's the, ha the connection here? So Etch-a-Sketch is arguably the, one of the most iconic American toys and just a great piece of American popular culture the concept of an Etch-a-Sketch device was uh, introduced in 1959 by a French electrician huh. named André Cassan, and he introduced it at a German toy fair in Nuremberg, West Germany in 1959. And then the next year, um, he partnered with Ohio Art, and they started producing these, and the first Etch-a-Sketch rolled off the production line in Bryan in July of 1960. In Ohio? Right in Ohio. That's so, amazing. Yeah. So the, uh, the Etch-a-Sketch essentially works with a system of wire pulleys. So the two knobs here um, operate those pulleys. One moves uh, the pulleys vertically and the other moves it horizontally. And then attached to the pulleys is a metal stylus which scratches away an aluminum powder that's covering the screen here. So whenever you make a line on an Etch-a-Sketch, that line represents a place where the stylus has been scratching away aluminum powder. So it's not adding any marks, it's removing the exactly. powder. Exactly. Yep. I did not know right? that. That's right. crazy. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, we're thrilled to have all of these pieces because they, you know, they're iconic American toys and most importantly they show Ohio's contribution to American popular culture and um, kind of these greater ideas of the world at large. So, Interesting. That's yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Now we go from modern to ancient. Giant beavers once roamed the lands in Ohio back in the days of the mastodons and mammoths. You might think meh beavers, but these ones were the size of black bears. Natural history curator David Dyer recently gave me some insight into these historic Ice Age mammals. So Dave, I'm very intrigued about this extinct giant beaver. Is it true they were the size of black bears? That's right, yep. Wow. They were huge rodents, um, much, much larger than today's modern beaver, and they were about 200 pounds, about the size of a black bear. Oh my gosh, so we've got a skull here, right? Right, yeah. Okay. And I'll pick this up, you can get an yeah. idea of the size of this skull. So this, looking at it at first, I think, okay, not a giant beaver, but compared to... Yeah, when you compare it to our modern beaver that we have today, you can really see the size difference. That's insane. 
This, so the, this, the body that went with this must have been quite large. It was huge, yeah, up to about 200 pounds. Well, this is a, a cast of a skull of a giant beaver. And this specimen is nice because it shows these massive front incisors on the beaver. Wow. Though they also have cheek teeth back here. And you can see they look sort of similar between the modern beaver and the, the Pleistocene right, beaver. Right, it's a very similar layout. Mm -hmm. So they probably had similar food habits. I noticed with the beaver that they're categorized as Ohioensis. Yeah, that's the second part of the scientific name. So their scientific name is Castoroides Ohioensis. Okay. And Ohioensis means from Ohio. That's cool. So the very first specimen of giant beaver was located right here in Ohio in 1830s. There's about 15 specimens of this critter that's been found in Ohio. Wow. So fortunately, most of them end up being donated to museums so we can have them for display and for education. An interesting sidelight to that is there, there were probably saber-toothed cats here in Ohio, but nobody's found one yet. We always tell people, if you find unusual bones or teeth, give us a call. Yeah, that's great that people know you're a resource for mm -hmm. that kind of thing. That's wonderful. It's interesting to tell people that, you know, the Ice Age animals aren't some far away thing, but they are found right here in Columbus, right in central Ohio. And probably a lot of these critters walk through what is, are, is today people's backyards. Right, that's kind of incredible. You do think of it as being far off, distant kind of connection. So moving kind of down the row here, what is, what's this? That is a single tooth of a mammoth. And you can see that this is the chewing surface. So this part is where the, the mammoth did the chewing. Wow. And the rest of this is the roots. Oh my goodness. And That's... these guys ate grasses and sedges. So as that tooth wears down from that constant grinding, the tooth can move up a little bit in the jaw and also start, it also moves forward in the jaw as the animal ages. Wow. So there's lots and lots of a grinding surface here for eating those kind so of So their teeth kind of shift as they Yeah, and age. if we look at this mastodon jaw, I can show you how that works. Um, if you think of our teeth, like we lose a, a deciduous tooth or a baby tooth, mm -hmm. and the new permanent tooth grows in straight below it. Right. And these guys, the, the tooth um, erupts in the back of the jaw and then slowly moves forward during its life. And as the tooth wears down, you can see this one's getting more and more worn down, mm -hmm. starts breaking apart and actually falls out the and front. And then it's just bumped up by a new one. Do they run out? Yeah, they do. Um, elephants have a predetermined number of teeth. So mammoths, mastodons, and modern elephants. And they usually will have six teeth on each side of the jaw and each side of the skull. And as those teeth rotate through, and what we see here is the very last tooth in the sequence. So this tooth will eventually wear down, move to the front, fall out. And then when the animal runs out of teeth, it dies of starvation. It runs, That's it, kind if, of not fair. No, it isn't. But <laughs> if they're lucky to live that long, then they end up dying of starvation. So about how old are these specimens? Well, most of the specimens from Ohio are of animals that came in after the last glacier receded. So the last glacier was just about gone from Ohio by about 14,000 years ago. So most of these finds that, that we see are from about 11,000 to about 14,000 years old. And so what kind of animal in today's you know, culture could we compare these creatures to? The closest living relative of the woolly mammoth is today's Indian elephant. Were these all found in Ohio? Yeah, these all were, right. Okay. Yep. This one was found um, near Urbana, over in Champaign County. Mm -hmm. And this one um, was found in Columbiana County, near East Liverpool. Okay. And they've been found all over the state. We have a chart here that shows all the counties of Ohio and all the finds of mastodon or mammoth across the state. So these pieces are in your collection here, but if someone were interested in seeing you know, a full mastodon or something on display, how would they be able to do that? Well, if they come to the Ohio History Center, we have a complete articulated um, skeleton of the mastodon. Oh, wow. It's the Conway Mastodon. It was found on the Champaign-Clark County border in the 1870s, and it's now on exhibit and completely re-articulated. Re Just looking at this piece of a bone, it's incredible to imagine how big these animals were. Yeah, they were elephant-sized critters right here in central Ohio. On February 27th, spend a night at the museum at the Ohio History Center where you can experience the collection after hours and spend some quality time with the huge mastodon on display. It stands 10 feet tall at the shoulder and each of its ivory tusks weighs more than 100 pounds. Visit ohiohistory.org to learn more. This next story comes to us from California. Kevin Mount is autistic, but more importantly, he's a painter. And his story is a wonderful example of how art can sometimes speak louder than words. My name is Kevin Mount. I am 21 years old and I love to paint. It's very interesting the way it happened with Kevin because he started painting and doing drawings since he was very little. 
and I didn't pay much attention to it, honestly, because I thought that all the kids do the same. But as he grew older and older, and I continued visiting the same houses, there were no more pictures in the refrigerators anymore. And I was overwhelmed by the amount of paintings I had of Kevin. I like to use watercolors. Watercolors, I use more color than water because I like bright colors and I use small brushes. Paintings and brushes, bright and colorful. Everything is uh, bright and colorful, I think. He never stopped painting. It was just art. He couldn't do anything else. He developed fine until he was three years old. I was at three years old that we got the first one, that it was asthma. Four came the viral ego. At five came the autism. At seven, I believe, came the ulcerative colitis when he was 15 years old at Stanford. It came as a neuronal potassium blockage. What it means is that the immune cells, all the gates for the potassium are blocked. So his organs function without potassium. There's no cure for that. My focus was do therapies and tutorials and all kind of stuff trying to fix Kevin. <laughs> And it took time for me to realize that I had to help Kevin to be Kevin, not to make him like somebody else. And when that happened, everything changed. He's always so happy, and he likes people to see his art. He likes to share his art. All his paintings are bright and colorful. That one is a Japanese girl that is blue and it's black and red. And this one is a, a cat with blue face and it's black spots and yellow eyes. And the next one we have is uh, the birds. All those parrots are a little bit big, so they have blue beaks and they're red. The other one is orange and they have purple and blue of animals come from the rainforest. They have all those bright colors. This one is the Joseph and the Amazing Teshe Card Dream Code that we went to see at the Music Circus. It was amazing, so the show was great. So the, all the code is a little bit liner and it's all the rainbow colors. He always surprises me, every day surprises me. These cards is my passion, my connection with the world. He goes once a month to an infusion of uh, immunoglobulin to Sari Hospital. Um, and when he goes, he's hooked with needles and cutting all his equipment, doing the treatment and draws and paints with uh, markers in this board. And people love it because these people go for very, very heavy treatments. And it's just to relax them, just to see Kevin painting for them. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to do. Other people appreciate giving that. I think that that's the best gift. I'm very thankful because in a way, I've been taking care of him, but he's been raising me you know, to be a more complete person and appreciate little things. I know now what a passion is. That's the biggest lesson that Kevin had given me, is that I know what a passion is. A passion is not something that you like or you do it as a hobby. A passion is when you are consistent, determined, and you have the strength and the courage not to stop. He wants to be an artist, which I think that he is already. <laughs> but in his mind, he knows, you know, that the world is waiting for him. My dream is to go to art school. To go to art school, you have to make sure you finish all your schoolwork, get that done. And then when you finish all the schoolwork, then you go to art school and then to college. I think that Kevin had a lot of purpose, not just the art. It's to make a change on people to appreciate the world different. And I think that he can make a difference in, in the world. 
I like to create art for everybody. I love creating. We're gonna do painting forever. When you grow up in a family full of artists, it's probably unsurprising to find that they've somehow influenced your own sense of creativity. Yet the artist in this next segment tells us how, yes, his father impacted his work, but then how he was able to evolve into his own unique style. For me, art is plumbing the soul. There is a need to express. And the question is how that expression becomes artful. Painting is the most magnificent creative capability that I know of as a visual artist. My name is Michael Roque Collins and I'm an artist. When I was a young boy, my parents, my grandparents, my aunts and uncles were all artists. So that might doom me to servitude, stretching, sizing, and priming. And that was the case. But my early passion was in drawing. Eventually, dreams that I had from my childhood became the driving force in my art. My father, Lowell Collins, was a well-known artist in our region. He spent most of his life in Houston, but studied abroad, Art Students League in New York, Colorado School of Arts and Design. He came to Houston, had a variety of jobs teaching at Rice University and University of Houston. And he also ended his uh, professional teaching career as Dean of the Museum School, now called Glassell. When I was growing up, to have two parents and aunts and uncles that were all artists, it was a, a blessing and somewhat of a curse. But that's part of the struggle. We each, as artists, find our own voice. I realized as a painter that we need to go deep, deep into what we do and be singular with our experiences. We differed in the sense that I'm continuing focusing on painting, where his life was more of a renaissance creation, where many, many aspects professionally in art became a factor. I was classically trained and when you look at the series of my work over time, I started off with a series that was representationally related to recording people, places, and things. The realistic years. Then my work started to take on the notion of dreamscapes. And then finally, after many years of narrative, that narrative started to ebb in the mid-2000s into work that dealt with post-symbolistic tendencies where I'm wanting the viewer uh, to have an experience, to encounter a, a light, land, darkness, enlightenment, and have their own conclusion, their own narrative, their own story becomes told by their engagement with the composition. So I think art does reflect our life's journey loves, our relationships, all those great things that make our culture exciting to live in. I think true success is the ability to find something in your life that provides joy. And if that joy can provide that experience of painting can provide illumination, um, a certain enlightenment to others, uh, even reflecting uh, the tribulations in life. You do your job as an artist to communicate those tragic glories that are humankind. And I hope at the end of my life, I can say that my work has meant something, that it relates to fundamental issues about the human condition, the heart, the emotion, and that it has a connection, a deep connection to future generations that would look at it and experience and locate and find newness upon each glance.
Last year in Columbus, the ballet, opera, and orchestra joined forces for the first time ever to open their season with one big collaborative event they called Twisted. Well, a similar initiative is playing out in Dayton. Check it out. As a new ballet springs into production, the Dayton Performing Arts Alliance is in the midst of another creative collaboration. I just find it endlessly fascinating to watch the work that Karen does with the dancers in the studio because she's, in a way, essentially doing the same job that I do, but in a, in a different medium, a different discipline with different language. It's always interesting to see how someone else handles the interpersonal relationship with the artists. For every minute of choreography you see, it's between an hour and two hours of work. But you really have to find things within the music, within the layers, to be able to start to pull steps from it. I can remember times when I would see a phrase in my head and then look and see that it actually came to fruition. It's just mind-boggling. That's what I thought in my head. This is so great. It's also nice to see what the dancers have to bring to it. I mean, you might give them something, it may not work, and so you're seeing where they're gonna go with it. But that's a really important way for a dancer to grow because it helps them become choreographers themselves. It helps them to listen to the music better. They become part of the creation. People will say, oh, it's Karen's ballet, and I always say, you know, it's not, it's not my, because I didn't do that step, they did that step. The preparation routine for the musicians and the dancers is very different. The dancers, you know, take a fairly long period of time to learn the work. Standard is a five-week rehearsal period um, to put on a show. And then our weeks are normally six-day weeks, working about nine to five. The musicians, on the other hand, you know, they have the music in hand about a month ahead of time. And they work on their own. For us to put together a ballet performance in three rehearsals, including address rehearsals with the stage and everything else, is a fairly normal occurrence. Uh, and it sounds insane, but that's the way we do it. As long as everyone does their homework, we're good. Neil is wonderful, uh, Neil Gittleman, our conductor, because he will come into the studio and watch and read the music at the same time. I spend time in the ballet studio watching the piece and learning what happens and making little squiggles in my score so that I know what's happening in the dance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the music. We can't ask for more than that and um, I think that that's one of the key components uh, to getting it right. Dancing to live music is so much better. I love it. When we're dancing with the Dayton Philharmonic, you can feel energy in the building. It's just uh, complete package. You can hear the instruments better. You can really hear like the soul of the violinist. The spontaneity and the energy that you get in a live performance that you can't really get anywhere else. And that's what makes it so exciting. It's the, the difference between a microwavable meal or a five-star restaurant. I mean, you're gonna get full one way or the other, but how do you do it? The new ballet is about the decisions we make in our journey through life. Four weeks from curtain, creative decisions are beginning to take their final form. We might finish it today or tomorrow, so I don't actually know what, how's it, how it's going to end yet. <laughs> I don't even have the music for it. Three weeks before the first rehearsal, the librarian has the parts ready for us to pick up. One of the challenges of playing uh, a new piece of music is there are often no preconceptions about what's supposed to happen. It's all a mystery until we get to the first rehearsal and put it together. And sometimes it just clicks and it makes sense, and sometimes we're all looking at each other like, what, what's going on? So that's why we have Neil. Creating something new takes inspiration, energy, and courage. The anxiety starts back up when you get into the theater and then you look at it for the first time as an audience viewer and you think, what the heck did I do? 
but you just have to walk away and trust that the baby will come out perfectly with all 10 fingers and 10 toes and everybody will be happy. It'll be an awesome show. I love collaborating. I think the fact that we have this very unique collaboration between the Philharmonic and the Opera and the Ballet, I think we're still the only city in the States that has joined forces. It gives us the opportunity to do things that we otherwise wouldn't be able to do. And those things are starting to bear fruit, and I think it's the arts, so it ain't easy. But I do think that we are stronger together than we ever were or would have been separately. That's our show. To see all of today's stories, visit WOSU.org. And be sure to like us on Facebook and give us a follow on Twitter. You can also find our videos on the free WOSU Public Media mobile app. You're listening right now to the sounds of the local indie rock band Earwig and their latest single titled Wasted on You. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on Broad and High. But I'll be second to none. It doesn't matter now, even if you're sorry. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council, a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences.